called Twilight is interesting because I got to see it from different lens. So while I'm going to share with you uh, what happened on Twilight, uh, I want to back up first and talk to you a little bit more about how I see transmedia. And um, we could argue about uh, the definition of transmedia forever. And you know, I know Brian has his own theories about budget and uh, everything too. Um, but I want to back up a little bit and talk to you a bit more as it not as the art form of transmedia, but as the cultural product that is transmedia. So let's start at the very beginning, the evolution of storytelling. Um, since the beginning of time and the way that we are wired as human beings, that we're wired to tell stories. And it's how we come to understand ourselves and the world around us. It's how we come to bring meaning in our lives, is through storytelling. And it's been like that from the beginning of time. I think early on, and oh, you can't really see this so well, but um, early time in the cave paintings, you know, that's how histories were told and um, passed on from generation to generation in those visual forms. Telling stories around the campfire was how we, we shared with each other, again, histories and culture. The theater as well. And in, if you think about the, the theater and uh, campfire situations, though, you have a situation where you've got storyteller and storytelling, kind of like in this situation. We're, we're in the same space, and any performer will tell you that their performance is different on every, any given night based on the audience, and that there's kind of a dynamic a process going on between the storyteller and the audience. And um, what happened then is you insert communication technologies. Well, so they're the active. And they insert communication technologies at the mass level, printing press, radio, uh, film, and TV. And all of a sudden are these great, beautiful, shiny toys and very exciting ways for us to take this human fundamental need for story and put them into the, in the use of these technologies. But what happened is that with the, these technologies, storytelling became very passive. Storyteller and storytell ease, which I keep telling my mind, but it's like audience, were very separate from each other. And the storytellers created stories in the vacuum and then pushed it out to, to the mass audiences. Well, cut to, to where we're at today, and with all the new media that's emerging here, is we've created, there's a new system that's emerging. And it's, it's bringing us back to actually the way that storytelling used to be, and the way that we're actually fundamentally wired for story and being in an active process where storyteller and story audiences get a chance to merge and share their experiences and have this kind of ever-evolving um, relationship. And we talked a little bit on the, pan about, on the panel the other day, um, and that's a, it's a challenge for both story for storytellers to start to understand that. But what I think is it's a really awesome opportunity because it starts to bring storytelling to a much richer experience and that you can impact audiences in a much richer way. So cut to going to convergence culture. We're going to go backwards a little bit to where we get the idea of transmedia. And um, transmedia itself came from Henry Jenkins, who in 2006 he wrote a book called Convergence Culture, which many of you are probably familiar with, talking about how this old media system that um, from the top down, that was kind of creating culture from the top down, this passive media system, was starting to merge with the new media system and the stories and the abilities that people were able to do with all this new media coming from the bottom up. Um, and that was the merging of the story of storytelling options and what he called was convergence culture. And as a byproduct of convergence culture was transmedia storytelling. So as I see transmedia, transmedia is a product of culture. As much as it is in an innovation, this is not something that's going to pass. This is something that is, is emerging, and it's in the cultural landscape. So transmedia is something that uh, is human. And as much as we're making art forms of it, and there is different ways to build new ways of telling storytelling around it, first and foremost, it's a cultural product. So if it's a cultural product, then the key is to know what it is that, that makes transmedia transmedia so that we can build stories that actually engage audiences. Henry Jenkins has said that at the heart of uh, convergence culture is the transmedia impulse. And doesn't, people don't talk about the transmedia impulse much in transmedia circles, which is why I want to insert it, because this is really important. The transmedia impulse is the desire to participate, engage, and immerse oneself in stories across platforms. It's that desire to be in story. And that is the behavior 
in your audiences, to stay engaged with your property. And that's the behavior that you want to ignite. The goal in making a successful transmedia property then is to ignite that transmedia impulse in your audiences. So when we look at transmedia, we say yes, yes, it is telling stories across platforms. And sometimes the definitions of transmedia stops and ends there. And it is important that we build them across platforms, because that's what it is. But what I think is the important part here is that it's also story consumption across platforms. And that we're taking people and we're moving them. You're not just building the platforms, you're moving them from one story to another. And you want to ignite that transmedia impulse in order to, to move them and get them so that they're immersed in your story. And that's the challenge. And that's the challenge about getting engagement, and that's also the challenge, I think, in the monetization and trying to find a solution to that problem as well. So then the question is, then how do we ignite the transmedia impulse in audiences? Well, from a psychological standpoint, there are three fundamental things to understand about igniting the transmedia impulse. First and foremost um, is transportation into story worlds, which basically is that you, get, you transport audiences into your story world. It's if you've ever read a book and you can't put it down. If you've ever, through that new phenomenon of binge viewing, it's totally about transportation. You want, you're so engaged with that story and the characters, you want to know where they go. You want to know what's going to happen next. And it's so trying to, so creating a story that's compelling enough to transport people away to where they're in that story, their lives, they, the, their lives around them doesn't part, isn't interested in them anymore, they're completely in your story. And that's going to ignite them and move them from one platform to another because they're going to want more. Belonging with story communities. Now, in, a, in the old passive system, the media system, we never had to de worry too much about um, story communities emerging. But the reality is that as human beings, we also are striving and wanting to belong. And we want to belong to communities. And right now, what we have the opportunity to do is create story communities that um, allow people to feel a part of, to be in a place where they can identify with that story, they have a passion, and then be with other people who are part of that same passion. And it's really organically happened. It's happened before if you think of like Star Trek and Star Wars. It's happened in the past. But what's happening now is that it can happen and they can organize and they can share and be in community at a much uh, quicker level and a global level for that matter. So as we build that transmedia, trying to gain that transmedia impulse, again, if you can create that space of belonging, a place for people to belong and nurture that, that's also going to get people to move from one platform to another. So successful transmedia properties, which is what we're, our goal is here, um, means that you need to come back and you have to have strong storytelling and engaging story experiences um, across platforms. Simple enough, right? So. Um, now, traditionally, if we look at the traditional media system, particularly, and I'm thinking from the perspective of Hollywood, where I come from, your job of storyteller and creating strong storytellers is the job of your storyteller. Your storyteller will come in and make good stories and then pass that off to a marketing team. And then that marketing team, primarily their job is to engage audiences, to build awareness, to build a fandom, and to uh, uh, literally get butts in seats is what they're supposed to do, you know? They work somewhat together, but not really. They're two separate silos, two separate budgets. Well, in a transmedia system, your storytellers, of course, need to keep telling some more stories, but they get to, to need to start thinking also a little bit like marketers and think about engagement. And how do you engage our audiences within that story world that you're creating? And marketers, of course, need to keep thinking about engagement, but they also need to start thinking about storytelling. And how do you create story experiences that audiences get a chance to immerse themselves in? And taking the existing story and either extending it or creating places for them to dive into it, that then helps build that audience and helps build the awareness and, um, so that it can grow, which is that ultimate desire for every, every property. Now, interesting to point out here is that where you have the storytellers and marketers where they haven't worked together before, the, the important thing is now that there's collaboration. They have to be working together, utilizing the gifts of both, of both hats to create a robust story experience for people. Um, but it also means here you have siloed budgets. We have production budgets and we have marketing budgets. Well, we have to start rethinking that and rethinking about how those budgets merge 
to start creating ways to monetize that whether it be from revenue or using uh, extensions and stuff in ways to create um, engagement and audience uh, growth. So as, from that, based on that idea of transmedia as a cultural product and as wanting to ignite that transmedia impulse in people, break it down into five key qualities of successful transmedia strategies. Now, these five key qualities, I could probably talk an hour on each one of them. Uh, if you're interested in more, I'm looking to teach a webinar in 2014. So if you're interested in that, please visit my website, storydisruptive.com, and shoot me a note from the contacts page and put webinar on the thing, and I will uh, make sure to keep you posted. But for right now, I'm just going to gloss through quickly what each of these points are. So the first and most important thing, and it's been talked about here this week uh, as well, is story, story, story. You need to have a good story, and not all stories are created equal. And first and foremost, making sure you have a story that's engaging and compelling and is going to draw people in at those fundamental universal human themes. It goes back to what Joseph Campbell was talking about, and if you're... Uh, if you know of Joseph Campbell, he was an anthropologist who went and studied s stories across cultures and across time and found that all stories that came to the cream of the crop within a society end up having the same natural themes because it was hitting on something that's fundamental to just being human despite culture and geographic location. Um, and it was that hero's journey, you know, that journey of the hero that uh, goes through the process of going to be afraid and to do something and to fail and to succeed and ultimately, ultimately succeed. Um, and there's, I'm really glossing over his ideas, but Joseph Campbell is someone who I think is very fundamental. And for us to go back and start thinking about as we build stories, that we're building stories that return to that point of engagement of really telling quality stories and not just pushing any story out. And once you have that engaging story, then you have cross-platform you know, strategies which is oftentimes where transmedia strategy starts and ends, is just building out platforms. Um, and, but it does need to happen. So as your second phase here um, is you're building out story extensions and platforms. And this is where monetization starts to kind of work itself out, I think. You know, again, we have those marketing budgets and those production budgets. Here, as you start to build your story extensions, and you're building story extensions that serve, again, the overall story first and foremost. That, that you can start to identify what, are, what, what is building audience engagement and what extensions are building story and opportunities for maybe revenue and um, that are going to be places that people want to come to and be willing to pay money for. Um, so this kind of goes in with the engagement, but which I'll get into in, the, in number four. Um, but first and foremost, we have, you have to have a plan and start building out a timeline to looking at your property over the course of ideally, you know, however long that is and how all the different extensions work with each other. Um, cohesive and consistent storytelling. This is where the story bible comes into place. As you create all these different extensions, it's important that that story is, um, is nurtured and taken care of because you want your audience to have a full transporting experience and not get thrown by little idiosyncrasies that aren't supposed to be there. So. Um, when you have a small independent property, oftentimes this just has to be yourself and your producing team, and that you're building out and making sure that everything is consistent. But as your property grows, and hopefully it will, that is the ultimate goal, you need to make sure that as your team grows that you create and make sure that there is somebody in the middle who's watching that story and really making sure that, that as you engage different creatives in the web space or the game space, that they're taking that story and bringing it out in the way and shape that you want it to. Um, interactive story experiences, this is where that transmedia impulse comes into place, um, where start looking at all those cross-platform, again, this works with number two, your cross-platform strategizing, and looking at, okay, where are we engaging audiences? What are we asking them to do? And is it reasonable, really? Like, oh, stepping back and looking, like, what is the overall story experience here that we're asking of our audiences? And um, would I do that, you know? Sometimes it's like, would... Mama Joe in Detroit do this, you know? And you have to ask yourself, because sometimes we get so protective of story, we don't think about that need to move, again, to move people. Finally, story communities. Um, and this is really important too, and I, 
could, should probably come up early on as well, that we have to start listening to our, and thinking about who our audiences are in early development. Thinking about identifying your audience early on and listening to them really early on. So you can understand what moves them and who it shapes them and what brings them into, um, uh, into the desire for that story. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit on Twilight, but that's, you know, you ha to understand, because you can say that they're one in way shape, but then they're gonna change throughout. But if you can start early and understand where they are, then as your property grows, you can continue to build that audience and also shape the story experiences that you're offering them. And then key to that is the nurturing as well the need for building a relationship with your audience. Again, the audience is not far away anymore. The audience is in this with us. And inviting audiences in to be part of that story experience, to create something with you. Um, and like I said, we talked about this on the panel the other day, and you know, storytellers are hard for them to let go of that. And you don't have to let go of it completely, but to own your property enough to know that what you want is for the best good of the property and the audience experience and making choices for that. And to be able to do that, you need to know your audience. So there's five key qualities of a successful transmedia property that engage both the storytelling and the marketer ideologies. Um, so now the transmedia case study on the Twilight Saga. Like was mentioned, this is the first time that um, a case study on Twilight has been shared on the transmedia. So I'm excited to actually share with you a lot of the stuff that happened in Twilight. Um, before though, I wanna first show you a little bit of background as to where Twilight hit on the scene and why one key parts as to why it became the cultural phenomenon that it did. So as I mentioned, there were four books, the four books that Stephanie Meyer wrote. Stephanie Meyer had a dream one night about a mortal who falls in love with a vampire and started to write a book. She wrote the first book, Twilight, sold it to Little Brown, and um, it, within a month of it being out, it was hitting the, the New York Times bestseller list, and soon thereafter, it was hitting number one. So it took off. So they engaged her for uh, three more books. There were four books in the series, and then Summit Entertainment bought the film rights and made five films, splitting that final book up into two films. So right as that final book came out, The Breaking Dawn, was right as the, Twilight, the first Twilight film, the campaign, was getting started. And um, so it was really ideal timing as far as a transition into um, taking that property and the fandom into its next level. But what was more interesting to me was what was happening in the cultural landscape at that time. The social media revolution was starting to take off. Now we had places like MySpace and people were uh, in community online on fan sites and personal page, web pages and stuff like that. But Twitter and Facebook, which had been going on for a little while, started to hit the mainstream in, a, in the midst of 2008, 2009, which is right as that Twilight film campaign was taking off. And our audience was already there. And they were living and breathing and moving and having their being in this social space. And um, by the time we released the first Twilight, it had already grown, and we had the most friends of any film ever on MySpace, and we were engaging with fans across 350 fan sites. By the time New Moon hit, we threw in a Facebook page because it was part of what we had to do because it was hitting the mainstream the way it was. And then when we got to Eclipse, we were up to 12 million fans, and by the time we hit the final Breaking Dawn Part 2, we were up to 31 million fans, um, the largest Facebook page on Facebook, and we had the largest uh, handle on, of any film franchise on Twitter, um, which is interesting also about the evolution of how the fans use social media, is that they, this is really how they congregated and communed together. Um, and to this day, Twilight, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Twitter is the place where they come together and organize and are in community. So all that said, over the course of these nine years, the franchise to this day has made over $6 billion. Now, this, and it still makes more money. Two days ago, they released the ultimate box set. Um, and so the money and that revenue is still coming in. Um, but something to, to note here is that Twilight, when the first Twilight came out, that Twilight film had an independent film budget. It was not going to be a blockbuster movie. It didn't have a blockbuster budget which is encouraging because it just means that any property 
you have an opportunity to hit into the zeitgeist of the cultural landscape and to hit into the zeitgeist of your audience and with a compelling story have the opportunity to grow into something as robust as what uh, Twilight became. So I'm going to go back through these five tenets and we're going to look at it through the eyes of being on the, trans the Twilight saga. First and foremost, compelling story. Stephanie Meyer's story uh, was uh, not a piece of literary fiction, but a piece of pop fiction. And the audience for Twilight was women age 8 to 80. So let me say that again, 8 to 80. That is a huge range of females. Now, what that tells me is that it, she, what she struck a chord in, and what I saw, was that it struck a chord in that fundamental human experience of being female, that love, desire, passion. Um, for young teenagers, it was the desire for that first love. For women who were older with families and kids or grandmothers, they were looking back and reminiscing about having their first love. So it was something that it was robust experience for all of them. And it, it, there's a, there's a no, misnomer that it's, this is just a franchise of teenagers, and it's not and you go into these premieres and going to all these events, you had people of all different ages and with different stories themselves. Um, and like I mentioned the other day, you know, the Twilight fans are amazing. They really are, and they're really passionate about this stuff. Um, and it was a compelling story. And over the years, I have interviewed a ton and ton of fans, and over and over again, they'd say how Twilight has changed their life, which is pretty phenomenal. You know, for some of them, it's... The, uh, they, the books were used for them as ways to get past uh, the grief of losing a loved one. Um, and then probably my favorite story was uh, a woman who I met uh, and interviewed at the Eclipse premiere. She's a 60-year-old woman, or was a 60-year-old woman, and she, had, she sheepishly admitted to me that she had seen New Moon in theaters 56 times. So she had gone back and into the theater and paid a ticket 56 times to see that movie. And then it came out on DVD and she watched it, I don't remember the number, but it was even more than that. And, um, but what she told me was even more, more interesting is she said, you know what, it's through these books and these films that I've decided to take a new direction in my life. And I want to get into something more creative and get into production design. And so I think that's pretty cool. A 60-year-old woman who's deciding and inspired to f do something new. Um, and Stevie Nicks was at the most recent premiere, uh, Breaking Dawn 2, and she was shared that the books um, were so inspiring to her, she decided to get back into the recording industry. And would you know it, this last uh, summer she just had a tour. So, compelling story. There was something there and it, that ignited that impulse in these, in these audience. Cross-platform storytelling. Um, this is, it, for the Twilight Saga, we, Stephanie Meyer was very insistent that there was no additions to her story world, kind of like uh, J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter. So uh, we, we had limited options for story extensions, um, but we still, there were the books, there were films, and uh, graphic novels and a novella. The graphic novel itself, Stephanie Meyer partnered with a artist, a Japanese artist, and in uh, and released a graphic novel on Twilight, a two-volume graphic novel that um, made record-breaking sales in the U.S., breaking records for graphic novels, and, um, and basically was just taking the original and the current story and offering it up in uh, a different format, another medium. Right before Eclipse came out, Eclipse, uh, there is a character in Ecl Eclipse named Bree Tanner. And uh, this character, Brie Tanner, does not exist in the books. And Stephanie Meyer wrote a novella about Brie Tanner. And it was the short second life of Brie Tanner. Now, in the context of the story, uh, the, in Eclipse, the big uh, nemesis is Victoria, and she's creating this new uh, newborn vampire army. And newborn vampires are very thirsty and hungry and want to kill a lot of people and are really dangerous. So she, and one of these people that she turns into a newborn is Brie Tanner. So the story is of this, this young girl who's a teenager who's been transformed into a vampire. And um, so Stephanie Meyer cr created this novella that shared just the life of this young girl. So by the time that then Eclipse came out, they had a chance to see, um, fans had a chance to see Brie Tanner in the film. And, um, and that was really exciting for them because if you can imagine, there was no story extensions, and if you're a rabid fan, they wanted more story. 
They just wanted more story, and they didn't get anything. So something like this was golden for them. And, um, and actually, interestingly enough, is that this, they, they released this in bookstores, and then two days later, they released it online, and, and fans could read it for free. They couldn't download it, but they could view it and read it for free. And despite doing that, it still broke, uh, broke records. In the UK, it was the fastest growing uh, novel, second only to J.K. Rowling. So um, that's pretty phenomenal. And I think that what that shares with us is that we can, as we think about new models for distribution, is that by taking the risks to do things differently, so that where in an older system it might not make sense, but in this system it actually might be feeding something larger and still be serving a larger purpose. The other place was fan fiction. So there was no, no story extensions, huge demand. I mean, fans I've interviewed over the years, over and over again, I just want more story. So fan fiction became a place that they would go to. And I bring it up here because while it wasn't an official extension, it became an important um, place for fans to go and consume more story. And, uh, and almost every fan, like I said, either had consumed fan fiction once or multiple times. Interestingly enough to, well, I guess the, the, the other point here is that, that there was a demand and no supply. And it was a, opt a revenue opportunity lost for the franchise in that respect. So if built out right and you have your community that's passionate and uh, excited about wanting more story, by building out, um, giving them more story via different extensions, you're actually serving something that they want and there's a revenue opportunities to be had. And this definitely showed us the way that they were consuming fan fiction, that that was the case. In fact, um, the, uh, the book Fifty Shades of Grey was originally a Twilight fan fiction and it had rose to the cream of the top of fan fiction. A ton of fan, uh, Twilight fans who loved it. She changed the names of the characters and a few things so it wasn't identifiable as Bella and Edward, and then created Fifty Shades of Grey, which is now a book series and a, bu a bunch of films. But she couldn't have done that without the Twilight fan base supporting her and, and her original stories as well. Because they were there, because they wanted more. So consistent and cohesive storytelling. So, Key here was staying true to the original canon, uh, and Stephanie Meyer really wanted to keep that, and it was part of the deal that she made with Summit Entertainment, where there was a Ten Commandments of uh, ensuring that certain her vampires were of a certain type and caliber within her world. Stephanie Meyer's vampire and uh, werewolf world is different than standard mythologies. You know, a lot of vampire mythologies have um, garlic, and you can't see them in the mirror. Um, in this world, the vampires sparkle in the sunlight. So you want to make sure that as, particularly as the franchise was growing and we were getting a ton of brand partners, um, that any time they did extensions for the property, that they were being true to this story world and they understood what the characters and um, uh, the ethos of those characters. And so what we created is a character mythology guide that helped guide them through um, making sure that across when all these people are working on it, that every experience for the fan was consistent and true. <clears throat> I need water. Um, so interactive story experiences. Uh, in lieu of the fact that we didn't have story extensions for audiences, um, this became really important, in, particularly in the marketing side of things, is to create really immersive experiences for audiences really for them to dive into the, uh, into the existing story world with the existing characters without extending it out. So um, here is where um, we had some ex ex executions I'll share with you, which, you know, over five years, there's a ton of executions. I'm only limiting it to a, a few here. Um, first and foremost um, was the Twilight... Uh, on the Twilight film, we did a fan contest where we asked fans to put together a one-minute video as to why they are the biggest Twilight fan. And the winner of this contest was going to be cast in New Moon and have a role, be able to go on to set, meet the cast. We put it out there. We received thousands of videos. Um, and uh, in the end, I think it was 8,500 videos came in for us to go through. And we had to find the cream of the crop ones. And the one that came to the top in the winner was this young male, Kai Wildermuth, 
and he had a great video. And, um, and then he went to the set of New Moon. And uh, the Chris Weitz, the director, liked him so much that he said, let's give you a walk-on role. So now this, he got not only did he get to meet the cast and go on to set, but he has a walk-on role in the movie and he brings the robe and puts it on the Volturi. Uh, so that was pretty cool. And on top of that, I've gotten to know Kai pretty well over the years because he became an intern then for us and ultimately ended up working on every film throughout the rest of the franchise and is a great editor and a great guy. So, um, On New Moon, we created a 360 immersive website where uh, uh, audiences could go into a scene of the movie that they hadn't seen yet and walk around and see the, uh, an, an action in a scene and be able to click on the various different characters and get information about them. And so, and over the course of the campaign, we then delivered a, se a series of opportunities for them to dive into these various different scenes. Um, again, scenes they hadn't seen. And in particular for scenes uh, that uh, were characters they had yet to see, like the wolf pack was revealed in New Moon and the Volturi was revealed in New Moon. So when we gave them those spaces to go enjoy, it was, it was a huge, coup for them to be able to dive into the film even before the film came out in that way. On the last Breaking Dawn film, we created a world map. It was uh, based on the idea that there, the story-wise, the, all, there's all these vampires from all over the world that come to support the Cullens and to help fight the Volturi. So created a map that showed and introduced audiences to these characters um, and showed where they existed, but it also took advantage of uh, putting that up against, putting that up against the worldwide fandom. And the, so the fans in the various different territories were also kind of mapped in those areas and worked together to um, unlock content. And uh, as a territory together, they had to work uh, unlocking contact. Um, and so everyone did this around the world. And then they also gave out um, travel packages to, uh, we had promotional partners that supported like giving away a trip it, to Japan and to Ireland, to the various places that these uh, vampires were from. Um, which, one of the things I love about this was it was the bringing in the story world, merging the story world with the experience of the fandom itself being that global fandom. So in, in creating um, uh, interactive experiences, a lot of times in Transmedia, we talk about just online executions, and online executions are important, and there's opportunities galore like we've been talking about here today. Gary talked today and in the last panel as well. Um, but uh, the other thing that's important uh, is the offline experiences, I believe, is that opportunity for your fans to come and be with each other in physical space is huge because it allows them a chance to actually be, have further identification and further investment in the property and their story experience overall. And that saw that grow from the first Twilight to the final one. It just grew and grew and grew. Of course, the fandom itself was growing, but the same fan, a lot of the same fans would come time and time again to the same events. Um, and in terms of interactivity, probably the, bis the biggest thing was interaction with cast and while that is a publicity and marketing thing as well, but the interesting thing from a psychological perspective is that whenever Robert Pattinson showed up and the fans would go screaming and like crying and being so excited, it was, it was their opportunity to see Edward in the flesh and blood. It wasn't Robert Pattinson. It was an opportunity to immerse them and have a place to physically see and be with their character. And that was true for all the cast. Um, kind of a projection of their desire and love for these characters for the actual cast themselves. So giving them opportunities where they could come and, and, and see these folks was really important. Um, and what emerged from that too was their community. And um, I'll talk about that in the next slide here. The other key thing in interactive story experience is merchandising. If you can do merchandising right, it's not only a monetizable thing, but it's a great way for fans to bring that story world into their own home environment. Um, in Breaking Dawn 1, spoiler alert here by the way, uh, Belle and Edward get married. And the wedding dress that Bella wears was designed by Carolina Herrera. And it was this big reveal. We didn't put it in any marketing materials. They had to go see it in the film. And fans were so excited to see this wedding dress. And so they saw the wedding dress and it was this lovely thing that they all fell in love with. And then they could buy replicas of it. 
and um, replicas of the engagement ring. And in the story, if you've read the stories, the idea is that she, Stephanie Meyer writes this from the perspective of Bella, the, the, the stories themselves. So the ideal fan is dying just to be Bella. All they want to be is to be Bella, to be the one that's in Edward's arms, or to be the one that's Jacob's best friend. And here, with this merchandising execution, basically, this is a fan, I'm not sure if you can see that, but that's a fan wearing the exact same dress as Kristen Stewart, marrying her own personal Edward, you know? And uh, being able to recreate that experience that, that they're so passionate about. Um, there's a lot of other great merchandising ex uh, examples I could give, but I'm not going to go into them. But uh, Summit worked with Stryker Entertainment, and they created some really great, um, great ideas there. Uh, story communities. So, of course, you know, the so social, psychological perspective that I have, I love the fan community, and I loved getting to know them. And what we did is early on, we started to get to know them. We started listening to them really early and started to building out strategies based on, on understanding and knowledge of that community from an anthropological perspective. Um, and uh, again, knowing what uh, made them move and what they loved, what they hated. Um, and again, like I mentioned yesterday on the panel, it, this is where that relationship with your story becomes like a parent-child relationship. You, know, you can't, if your kid says they want to, I said yesterday cheese, so we'll do that again. If they, you know, if they want to eat cheese at every meal, you can't just feed them cheese every meal. You want to, you want to encourage them to nurture them to survive and be the, you know, to, to ultimately grow and be the best person that they can be. That you also want to do that with your story property. And so you also, as your communities demand things, you don't always have to listen to everything. But you, a lot of times, there's some really great ideas that come from them. And to be able to have that ever-evolving relationship with your fandom only serves the property, overall property, in the end. So we listen to fans early and throughout and um, really worked on building respect with them. So there's two different relationships to, that were going on here, the fans with each other in, within the community, and then there was the studio and the fan relationship. Um, the fan relationships, as I mentioned before, started um, on fan sites, and the evolution of the cultural landscape went to MySpace, Facebook, and to Twitter, and ultimately lives in Twitter now. A lot of these relationships started online, and they became very close, and they just knew each other by their handles, and then they'd get together at these events and they'd meet each other in person. Um, or they'd go and they'd, they'd literally plan trips to Italy or to, um, to see the filming of New Moon or to Forks, Washington. I mean, Forks, Washington has a booming industry now because that's where the, the, the movie, the book is set. So um, they would go on meccas to Forks, Washington. And they'd meet up with each other and they'd have then shared experiences in the physical world as well. Um, and the, the friendships, you know, I, the, the box set that just came out two days ago, there's a documentary on, uh, on there that I produced on the fandom, the fans themselves, and um, there's so many, there's so much I could talk about with them, um, but I'm going to limit it a little bit here. Um, the studio and fan relationship, uh, again, going back to that listening to them, we, uh, the first piece that ever went out was a sizzle reel at New York Comic Con. It was the first thing that they'd ever seen of the film itself. Was received with screaming fans in the room, went online, went viral, and one of the graphic transitions that we had in there looked kind of like a trading card. All of a sudden, there was this buzz online about, oh my god, they're going to make trading cards, oh my god, they're going to make trading, this is so exciting, they're going to make trading cards. Well, we had actually already been talking about trading cards, but at that point in time, it was like, oh, definitely, let's make trading cards, because <laughs> they really were wanting it. And that became a signature thing that we did throughout the, can throughout the franchise for every film, was the release of trading cards as part of that overall experience. Again, an idea that came from the grassroots up that became a part of the official thing. Another thing, a uh, cultural thing, there's a lot of cultural things that the fans brought to the table that were part of the, the fandom, but uh, was camping, fan camping before the premiere. First Twilight premiere, had no idea fans were going to be camping. We hear word that there are fans camping down in Brentwood, lining up a day or two before the uh, premiere itself. News is picking it up. Okay, so we've got fans camping. Um, 
then we welcomed them into the premiere, I mean, into the, into the experience of the premiere. And by the time New Moon came around, realizing that this was part of the culture that was evolving with these fans, started creating a more official capacity of ensuring their safety and, um, and nurturing that experience for them. Well, by the time we hit the final Breaking Dawn, we had almost 2,000 fans camping in downtown LA for five days at LA Live. And it basically became this huge, like, five-day love fest of Twilight, and, um, which was done over a few films, but that, the ultimate one, the last one being the largest one that ended up happening, and became a huge part of what was the Twilight experience for fans, and what it meant to be a Twilight fan, and what it meant to be um, a member of this community. Um, the other important thing to m uh, mention here is that building respect uh, with the fans also came with uh, staying true to the story. And uh, we really enlisted the guidance and support of the super fans, those who were webmasters on website of the, the biggest fan sites, brought them in, treated them like press, gave them opportunities to interview the fans and special invitations to premieres and events. And in that way, what happened is, is that we built their respect, and then their respect was then transferred out to the larger community of the fandom and showed to, to the larger fandom that, that Summit was a means and an entity with which to, to respect. Um, and that also, in that meantime, of building a relationship that was really authentic as we spoke to them, and that really developing and diving into the using that two-way communication and not just pushing out media, uh, marketing messages to the fandom, but treating them with respect, sometimes even giving them the first look of a trailer. Uh, in New Moon, we pushed out the trailer to uh, the widgets. The widgets were a cool thing at that point in time. And we pushed out the trailer through widgets, and they, fans got to see it first. And usually, when you, a trailer is a commodity, and you usually give that to an outlet or something. And we, we treated the fans with respect to be able to give them those sort of opportunities, knowing that they were just as value as other publicity opportunities. Um, and then the final point on this one I want to share is about the Twilight Saga time capsule. This was something that we created um, and released during Breaking Dawn 1. It was an opportunity to aggregate the fans and bring them all into one place when they could share their stories and experiences. We created basically a timeline of the entire franchise from the, of, of the film from the time that Twilight marketing campaign started and the first releases, that New York uh, Comic-Con sizzle, and various different events that went along the way and put out our, all our official content. And then we asked the fans to join in and share with us what their stories were, with their pictures and their memories and their videos. And, they, and it came and they merged with the, our story timeline to become this um, robust just experience of what it meant to be part of the, the franchise. Um, and that lives today, as, it is a time capsule and has been used as a means, a place to get fan engagement also on the last film. Uh, so that's, that was exciting, you know, and executions like that are great. We did it later in the game, and it's one of those ones that if there were to be another um, uh, release of a Twilight property, which at this point in time they're not, that I am aware of, and that uh, you'd want to nurture a community like this, and there's a place to keep them ever evolved and stoking that community with opportunities to, for, you know, sharing their... Um, their, their trailers, their fake trailers, and their fan fiction, and their, all that sort of stuff. There's a lot of opportunities that um, you could use something like that with. So overall, that's, that's kind of a glossing over the Twilight Saga transmedia case study. Um, you know, when transmedia start, I mean, when, when Twilight started, um, as I mentioned, it had an independent budget, and we did not know it was going to become this global culture phenomenon that it was. With the ever-changing landscape that we're amongst today, where every day, literally, within every new technology, every new technology offers us the opportunity to create and tell stories differently. It allows audiences to consume stories differently. And overall, there's a rich amount of opportunities that allow any property, if done strategically and right, the opportunity to become a twilight. Um, um, but it requires um, some good strategic thinking that is involves an active media landscape. 
And um, what worked for Twilight isn't going to necessarily work for every property because every story, every one of you has a story to tell and that story itself is going to be different about as to the executions that need to be made. The audience is going to be different. And really when your property is hitting the marketplace and what's actively involved and what the ways in which that, um, that new technology is being emerged and adopted culturally and psychologically by audiences, that's also going to impact how um, a, uh, your particular strategic plan is going to work. So, but this is what's exciting about the future of storytelling. Perfect. And is that uh, there is a lot of opportunity out there. And if we build it, that they, that they can come. But we have to be smart about it because, again, just building transmedia across platforms and expecting people to come um, is not going to make it successful. You want to invite them in and make sure you're, you're, you're planning for that real transmedia, igniting that transmedia impulse and moving audiences across these platforms. Um, so the future of storytelling is really about us being strategic and smart and evolving with that ever-changing landscape. That is, I mean, literally, the, the entertainment industry of today is never going to be the same. I mean, of, of the past that used to be the same, where you could take strategic models that worked over and over again, it's not going to happen because that media landscape is constantly going to be changed. Change is the new normal. So needing to be aware of all that stuff and be strategic at every point to understand what's shifting and evolving in that landscape, both um, at a technology space as well as a cultural and psychological space. Future of story also is meaning, creating stories that have meaning, things that resonate and move people from, the, from those deep levels of humanity. And the future brings is that we need to be innovative. We need to be thinking smart and thinking beyond the box and building story in ways that we never would imagine to bring story out to people um, and really being innovators. And overall being visionaries, really thinking about this outside of what we know being willing to take risks, being willing to fail, being willing to collaborate and share and, and share in the journey of what the future holds for us. I mean, we get to build what is about to come. And what you build is going to influence what I build. And so together, it's what we get to do is to create what the, it's going to look like in 20 years from now. Um, and it's really an exciting time to be a storyteller. And it's a really exciting time to be in this industry.